Hi, honey. <laughs> Hi, March. This is so, I think I, this is a first for me and for us. Because you were just over here last night. Was it last night or the night before? Night before. Like, well, Sunday, Sunday, yeah. We have to explain to people, I just moved into this house. That's the little, look at my little house. That's I'm very, yep, it's beautiful. It's full of unpacked stuff, but there you have it. There you have it. Well, we should welcome all of our TDF folks and everything. Because are they are they sitting time. outside in that in that? That's right. They're religious. sitting outside our houses. <laughs> I, I want them to be on Times Square in the sitting in the with holding their little cameras and sitting in the breach bleachers. I think it'd be great. That would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, you go through Times Square right now, and it's very depressing. So. I know. So, but, but anyway. But maybe, but, maybe it's almost over. Maybe it's almost over. Have you oh, got your shot yet? No, not yet. Have you? Well, you know, I have to say they keep saying now, because I'm 112 years old, I, I can get it anytime I want to. But you, you try to find instructions on how to get registered. Good luck. Yes, I know. I know. So I, I heard the same thing. Yeah. You can in New York. A friend of mine did it. And um, uh, he's going up to the Bronx. He made an appointment. They said they wouldn't be, you wouldn't have to wait. You just come five minutes before. So uh, he's going to go on Monday. I'm curious. I'll, I'll check him out. My I'm doctor not... is said uh, February. So I don't know. Well, you know. Yeah. I, I think I'm so old now. I should be. They should be. <laughs> Knocking at the door with a needle, but I'm going to call the hospital. Oh, that's Nearby. a good idea. Yeah, that was a good idea. Yeah, well, that's enough about theory. my health. Yes, right. Let's, let's talk about our extraordinary career. Yes, so let's tell everybody how we met because it's well, here's, here's of another a, age. A question just comes up on the screen and it says, Yes, you two have been friends for quite a while, dating back to the 70s. Can you talk about how you met? Go ahead. Do you remember the actual moment? I don't. I remember meeting you in the stairwell, coming down the steps, and you were on the uh, on a certain floor. I was coming down from the costume shop, I think, getting fitted for one of the many plays. Well, that no, hold, 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 hold! You got to stop. You're way ahead of ourselves. Oh, this is San Francisco. Right. This is it, about it, 1970. Yeah. Uh, Marsha Mason, the, who you're on the left part of my account and my picture here, had gone almost under cover of night <laughs> out to ACT, Bill Ball's great company. She'd been offered, I think, maybe one of the greatest season any actor has ever been offered. And you were coming off a soap opera, if I'm not wrong. That's right. That's absolutely And you sort of leapt out of a burning window into repertory theater yeah well and i was only hired for one role and the rest was as cast and i wound up uh, doing it was to be roxanne and cyrano with peter donat and bill ball was directing and the rest was as cast did you audition for bill did you audition for bill i never knew that no because what happened was i lied uh, <laughs> And said that um, they had my. They called my agent and said they were looking for somebody to replace Michael Learned uh, right. for a summer package of but one. She was of going to the the Waltons. From, or, that's right? right, and she was going to the Waltons at, for uh, private lives. And I lied and said that. I, and they, one of the caveats was you you had to have done it because there was only a week's rehearsal. And I lied and said I had done the show, and uh, I hadn't. But you uh, dreamed. Maybe you dreamed that you did. I did. So I memorized it over a weekend, with the exception of the tea scene because it was impossible. It's all tied to a business, and I had no idea how it was staged or anything. So I arrived and I um, I didn't tell anybody until a certain key moment in rehearsal, uh, the stage manager uh, was putting me in, that lovely guy. Um, uh, um, Do you know Barconi? Yes. Yeah. And um, I, I whispered in his ear and I said, I, I don't, and he said, oh, honey, don't worry. They, they never remember their lines. <laughs> 
So then Bill came to a run through with the director of the winter piece who happened to be Francis Ford Coppola. And um, Bill was stunned to find out that I had never done the show. And so consequently he offered me the Roxanne and as cast. And then through a series of events, the leading lady that they uh, thought they were going to have, um, it didn't, um, she took a different job. Um, I believe it was a series uh, down in LA it was Barbara Colby and- um, Oh, we loved Barbara Colby. I know. And yeah. so um, she, she um, decided not to do the season and then Bill did, wasn't sure what to do. And then he just picked all those plays that I did. But and Barbara did do the season. She did do the season. Because she played the Grand Duchess Olga Katrina for us. And you oh, can't right. take it with that's you. Right. She did. Why was it that that happened? I don't, I don't know. No, because yeah. this is we've never although we've talked about this situation many, many times in our incredibly long and vigorous friendship. <laughs> we've never said I've never these are details I don't quite remember. Yeah. But Barbara was there because uh, that's when I started meditating and the three of us used to meditate together. Well, she was the one. Well, she was the one. You're right. I mean, because she was in Doll's house with me. She played in Doll's house with you. And yeah. Did she play Portia in, in Merchant of Venice? Yes. And I, I played Jessica. You're that's right. right. But at any rate, let's get, anyway. let's get to the core. Yeah. The core is that I'm out there with Ellis Rabb's production of You Can't Take It With You. And my leading lady is to be Marsha Mason, who I've never met before. So right. we meet, according to Marsha, uh, and this is as good as any answer we're going to get, we met in the stairwell or something like that. But I could never get her to rehearse. You, had, you were never available because you were in rehearsal for Cyrano. You were in rehearsal for Doll's House. You had all of these parts. Yeah. And, and, and it, was kind of, it was kind of wonderful because the attitude in those days is, well, it'll work. We'll figure it out. It's Nobody right. was really stressed. Nobody, yeah. it was kind of wonderful. And I was and, totally intimidated because um, of uh, the fact that Rosemary Harris had been your um, um, Alice. Alice. And and so I was so scared. I remember you, you described in great detail how she came down the steps in the blue dress. And I thought, oh, I'm going to clunk down those steps. I'll never be like Rosemary Harris. I was a very bad director at that point to even bring it up. I must, I must say, Jesus, why you didn't why didn't you clock me one? That no, be... no, no, no. You were. But wonderful. anyway, we became incredibly close friends. Yes, we did from that moment on. And look at all the work we've done. I know. I, I you know. know. I kept thinking, how much have we done? Tons. So that when you went through your divorce, if you don't mind my bringing that up, I called you on the phone and said, I was at the Globe by that time, 1970, uh, no, 83, 82, 81, 82. And I called you on the phone and said, I'll never forget this. I offered you Viola oh, in 12th now. Yeah. And I said, Marsha, the, the, the pay is $500 a week. And you burst out laughing. And I said, and you're worth every cent of it. <laughs> now, listen, but the other memorable collaboration that we had before that was you got to direct The Good Doctor for American Life. I did. And that was also because of our friendship. That's right. Because Lindsay Law, who's still a friend of ours and a neighbor of ours, was producing great performances at that time. That's right. Exactly. And I don't know, somebody went, I don't know who initiated that, but because you were married to Neil at the time and you both knew me and Lindsay and I were best friends, it sort of was an inside deal. We did it with Richard Chamberlain and Lee Grant and Bob Dishy and Ed Asner. What a cast. What a cast. It was great. Yeah. Well, I had just finished doing the Broadway show of The Good Doctor. Um, and then we filmed it and then I did 12th night, I guess. And then we did, um, did we have a long pause there? No. Yeah. Was the next one impressionism yeah. on Broadway? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. during that period of time, 
We were incredibly. Oh no, ahead. we did. We did the Schiller play in oh, L.A. Oh. at the Amundsen. Mary Stewart, yeah. Yeah. With Michael Learned. With Michael Learned. Yep. Yeah. And Bob Foxworth. That's right. Yep. Yeah, that One was of the hardest pieces I've ever worked on in my life. And because I came up, you know, you learn things from things and you going in, you think, well, it's just another play. But the Schiller, Mary Stewart, is a great, great German poem. Uh, he wrote in poetry, which is very dense. And so we've had the clever idea of having a very stripped, very modern, very simple, straightforward <laughs> text and took all the poetry and all the fun out of it, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> well, the only thing that I remember is not so much that is that Amundsen stage and we had no ceiling. We were actually in this huge cave, barn. Of 20, a barn of 2,500 seats. And I, I never, uh, I've never worked my voice so much. I mean, I wound up with two or three octaves at, on either end after that show. I bet was, you did. Yeah, it really was. It was really interesting to do. But boy, it was hard to fill that theater. It was, it was hard, to period. I remember I was not at my best. You know yes, you have always were at your best. No, honey, I came into your dressing room <clears throat> and as and I, I, say, I tell this about myself. It's the worst direction I've ever given an actor in my entire life. Mm. And and I I looked at you and I said, "Be radiant." <laughs> That's right. I do remember that. That, that'll help. <laughs> I don't know how to do that myself. I've never been radiant. But if you have any radiance in there, throw it on the stage. And even while I was saying it, I thought to myself, why don't you take this job away from me right now? <laughs> and we remain friends in spite of it. Oh, God, oh, of course, because you you have the best sense of humor. You love actors. I do. To death. And they love you. Um, and you're so kind and, and basically supportive, with the exception of one or two directions, like be radiant. Yeah, be radiant. <laughs> That's one, you know. One of the best and most fun times I ever had with you, though, was in Impressionism. We because we left the, the heiress out. Oh, the heiress, that's right, at the Westwood Playhouse. Yeah, with Barry Let's, Sullivan. Yeah. God rest his soul. Yeah. Oh, I loved that part. Yeah, I you made yourself, you gave yourself a unibrow for me. I did. I did. I had anyway, I started to interrupt you. What what you said one of the most oh, you Well, impressionism, what I remember the most in impressionism was what I loved about it was the fact that I had two entrances, right? Just two scenes and two entrances. And because there wasn't much for me to do, um I decided I would always try to surprise you every time we did whatever the scene was. Do you yeah. know what I mean? whether it was a run through or anything. Yeah. I remember, I mean, I, I just, after a while, just cracked everybody up. And I was always trying to um, make uh, Jeremy Irons laugh because, uh, you know, he could be. It was be, such fun. It was great. Not that hard to do either. <laughs> so I had a good time doing that too. I mean, I, when I think about it, you know, Jack, the other challenge you gave me that was so terrifying and yet wonderful was in the Twelfth Night because you had uh, me singing that dirge of a um, ancient uh, song. Um, yeah. I can't remember. It's death something. Uh, Come away, death. Come away, death. Yeah. And so I was scared to death of singing uh, on the stage. So I I had to overcome that one. Hmm. Well, yeah. You did. <laughs> Listen, I have to explain this. There's thumping going. You have to realize, how do I yeah. do this? They're what? building a deck outside. Oh, They're yes. A... I can see it. Yeah. See that? Yeah. That's the light is sort of washing it out. but That's, that's not right. our fault. You know, yeah. What can I say? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we we have actually, when you come right down to, well, I mean, 19, 
70 on, I don't have many longer continuing relationships that in my life, like we have, and now we're living 20 minutes away from each other. Well, you're the one that got me to Connecticut. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you did. And then I left Connecticut. It's good. Now, we haven't even talked about the fact that I was your associate director. No, and I I want to I, I want to go on about this because one of the fascinating things about my friendship with you, right from the beginning, is I thought you were one of the smartest people I've ever known in my life. Oh, and, gosh. oh no, truly. And one of the truest. There isn't a phony bone in you. You can't, I don't think you can work if you're not telling the truth. I don't think it's possible. Artifice is not your middle word name there. Yeah, I know. And so, and you've had this interest in directing. And I have always thought, oh man, this is a great idea. But before before the the I made the offer to, for you to come and work with me on All My Sons with Annette Benning and Tracy Letts and um, Benjamin and, Walker, yeah, Ben Walker, yeah. Um, anytime I was doing a show and you were in town, I asked you to come and look at it because you gave me the best notes. Uh-huh. And if something wasn't working, you never pulled punches. You just said, "Well, that's terrible. You better fix that." <laughs> Or something yeah. akin to be radiant to a director. Let's get into that. Anyway, I, I I have depended on you for longer than is beneficial as being the person sitting on my shoulder that will tell me the truth in a way that I can use it. Not just I like it, I don't like it. You always had very specific things to say. Yeah, that's- and I thought to myself, man, very few people can do this. So now that you're taking these steps in this directing, and I know it's fulfilling to you. I know it is. Oh, yes, I love it. I've been having such a good time. And, and there's a market for you now. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, that I, I, years ago when I was very young, I realized there's a moment that happens in a director's life, if they're going to be a director, when somebody offers you a job and you can't take it because you're working. <laughs> <laughs> it's bliss. You're yeah. you're just a doorstep this side of that. Oh, that's great. And it's oh, gonna be cool. I get that. That would be fun. I, well, I do too, but also I want you to continue to to act. Oh yeah, me too. Me too. Come I, on, look at look at you. Look at you. Good <laughs> God, woman. There must be a terrible painting in the closet. <laughs> oh God, honey. Oh, but I think I think the other part of our friendship is partially because we are honest with each other. I mean, you are an extremely giving. I tend to be, uh, I think, probably a bit more cynical, a bit more judgmental, a bit more impatient. You you have that is one of the major things that I think I learned as the associate director on All My Sons was your patience. Um, And you said to me once, you said, no, no, let them find it, you know? And that was one of the most valuable directing lessons that you gave me. I mean, it's one thing to observe somebody as they're working, but it's quite another uh, to be able to uh, have somebody truly teach you, you know, as you did. I mean, that was a really important thing to remember. Well, one of the interesting things that one discovers if one does this long enough is there's no one way to do it. Yeah. There is no, there's no perfect, or there'd only be one version of Midsummer Night's Dream than anybody ever did. Right. You you go to a high school and watch it and are screaming with laughter. I mean, the great thing about those pieces is that, oh, oh my God, what happened? Did you go away? No, I'm here. Oh, I waved at my contractor and I just have too many things going on in my life right now. But anyway, I suddenly realized that the organic truth that comes from the people in front of you, they will make their own noise. And your job as a director is to conduct it, to sort of shape it, but not to get in the way. Because if you were an actor, you'd be an actor doing it. But to be a director is to stand apart and help. Yeah. And and until the direct, the actors are comfortable 
being dangerous, being candid, being rare, uh, not self-conscious. Well, see, the impressionist thing, impressionism issue is exactly that. You, you would just literally say to me, so what have you got for me today? And it yeah, just constantly made me think of different ways to make an entrance. And you know what I mean? Uh, and surprise somebody. Uh, so consequently, as an actor, to be given that kind of freedom to just be in the moment so fully and just be able to know that you're not being judged or being managed. Do you know what I mean? You're yes, just I do. Let loose. Yeah. Um, that was that was that was just great. I I I I'll just never forget that. It was so much fun. You know, it's it's you, we both had our share of success, and we've both had our share of lack of success, I suppose, if you want to call it. In an odd way, sometimes I can't tell the difference mm. because what is perceived to be successful to the world, to the critics, to the business, it can pass for a lot of different things. It's the discoveries you make in the room with the people you're creating with that thrill you, that make you want to come back and do more. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I remember of all of these pieces. I mean, there are a couple real stinkers that we don't have time for this afternoon. <laughs> but but nevertheless, yeah. you know, ev almost every one of those experiences has something dear and valuable and astonishing about it. And I think it's why theater is inescapably what it is. Why film that can stay the same forever, a recording can stay the same forever. You know, you, you, you polish them and you put them away. But theater, you fling it out there every night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, there's something breathtakingly brave about it. Sometimes you go and you win the lottery. Sometimes you go the next night and it just doesn't fire. Yeah. You think, I don't know why that didn't work. I yeah. was really good last night. Yeah, 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 yeah. Harvey Fryerstein is writing a book. Thank God he's doing a memoir. And he told me yesterday that the title is I Was Better Last Night. <laughs> is, is that not brilliant? I love it. I Andrew. love it. It it's was inspired. so perfect. Oh, my God. That's so great. Yeah, I was better last night. Marsha. Oh, yes. You recently penned an essay about missing theater. But you've been doing a lot of online shows. You have, too. What do you enjoy about virtual performances? And may I ask, how do you, how do you differentiate them? Um, well, first of all, uh, what's, what's surprising about them, if you have time to rehearse, I think it's imperative that you get time to rehearse. I've done it both ways where I've done a full length play um, virtually and we haven't rehearsed. And I don't think that serves the playwright or the audience necessarily because you're too disjointed. But if you have time to rehearse, then what happens is in an odd way, uh, when I did the Dear Liar with Brian Cox, the two of us had the same kind of feeling. It became a, a, a lot more intimate because you're not expressing it out right so you know you pr you're leaning into the camera in an odd way and consequently it kind of creates an intimacy and especially if that's what the play is about is a relationship or something like that uh from a directorial point of view it's completely different because um you are limited it's not like a movie um, you're, but StreamYard does allow you a bit more um, uh, options uh, to try and help tell the story by push, you know, by putting a smaller uh, view of somebody while somebody else in the foreground is speaking, and vice versa. But I think that there's a kind of intimacy um, that's kind of wonderful because you. Uh, you get to talk in a more intimate way than you would if an audience was there. Well, let but, me ask you this, because uh -huh. you also have had an extensive film career. Hmm. 
That's different from doing a close-up when the camera comes up on you. Is that is there a different feeling about that? Yes, in an odd way, yes. And I don't um, let me. You see, in a film, this is interesting. In a film, I I really feel the camera either loves you or it doesn't, and it's an indefinable thing. I don't know why uh, the camera works for some people and it doesn't for others. Um, but because you're surrounded by so much technicality in a movie, right? You've got all these people yeah. and all the focus is on you and trying to shut all that out. And the actor, if he's available, is on the side of the camera, right? Um, but here we are talking to one another. I'm now looking into the camera uh, on my computer, but I'm in my house. So I feel like I'm with you. I'm in your house, I'm in my house, and we're in our houses together, and we're having a conversation that we would have if we were having a drink together. Well, the other thing also is the technical aspect is frozen. I mean, it's it, you turn it on, you face your little camera, whatever it is. Bob's your uncle. Yeah. There's, there's not a lot of, I mean, as we can see on the lighting effects on me, it doesn't <laughs> help any. I but just you, have a ring light and some extra light to I don't balance. Want to talk about that. Okay. I, really <laughs> I, I look like a like a bag of potatoes here. By comparison. <laughs> but you know, that's why I told you we need to get a, a curtain for that door. Yeah, this door. Yeah, this, so I'm that, not getting it. No, no, no. no, no. Sorry, uh, <laughs> curtains for other things, not the door. Anyway, the point is, the point is this: <laughs> we're not distracted by gaffers. We're not distracted. No, by no. Lighting exactly. effects. Yeah. We, if yeah. something misses a cue, we don't go back to get it. So we're actually just able to be open in front of each other, which yeah. may be what you're saying about the whole virtual thing, because it's yeah. just what it is. There are no expectations on fabulous right. angles or tracking shots or anything because we're here we are. We're just yeah. trying to reach through to some shred of truth, I guess. That's right. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, I see Coda and Winnie in the background. My puppies. Well, yes. yes. There's Winston. Yes. Are they there together? Coda, they are. Yeah, they Coda. are. Coda. Coda. Well, there she's sort of looking, but she's more attracted to what's going on outside. Yeah, who isn't? <laughs> we were both okay. already working on Broadway when the Times Square tickets booth opened in 73. Do you have any vintage <laughs> tickets? Well, I have to say, as a director, I never buy tickets to the theater. But I'm constantly looking at that the, those, those risers to see if anybody wants to come and see my show. <laughs> I, I also think it's one of the most enchanting some sort of sweet, open, enthusiastic occurrences in an area that is becoming incalculably worse. There's so, you know, it's, it's so, there's all these billboards and stuff going on, but to see people reading those, trying to figure out what they're gonna see, talking, <laughs> sitting up there, I just love it. Did you ever, did you ever hang out there, Marsh? No, I never did. Let's. <laughs> You know, I never bought a ticket at there. I always paid full price. <laughs> I felt the theater needed my money. I, I, yeah, but we could go I there and pretend that- I started that this premium bullshit, which, oh, I'm sorry. I should probably can't say that. But uh, I- I, think I you should say it. Okay. I hate, I hate these, you know, thousand dollar ticket. I, it's just, and, it, and the actors aren't getting it, so- I get upset about that. I agree with you. And also, we're dangerously outpricing ourselves. Oh, totally. totally. You know, I mean, you should be able to wander in and see a play. When I was a kid, you know, I can't begin to do it. I was with APA. I think the top ticket was $18. Yeah, I know. And you could see Uta Hagen. You could see, you know, Rosemary Harris. You could see Donald Moffat. You could see all these extraordinary actors for, for 18 bucks. Yeah, yeah. 
I know. And I remember Nancy Walker was in the company when it went up to $18. And we were having coffee, a bunch of us sitting around. And, and Nancy Walker was like a great epic. She'd been in vaudeville. She'd, she'd been, a, a, you know, what was on the town. She did all these extraordinary, amazing things. A raspy kind of tough New York comedian. And she was very thoughtful. And we were talking about, boy, the, the price is the top price going up to 18 bucks. And she was very thoughtful. And she said, hmm, it's really hard to be $18 good every night. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, it's a great way of, well, it's a great way of thinking of your obligation to your audience, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. This and I think that's why the, pain. Well, but also that's why the ticket thing is so important because they you can get tickets at a reasonable price if you and you can have a fun time staying, um, you know, standing in line and waiting for it. I mean, I've had friends who come to New York and they've been kind of shocked that they've been managed to get really nice seats for a show uh, by going to the uh, the ticket line. Also, I love the rumor. It's on the booth. You can get, you know, go on, yeah, go down because yeah. you can get them. Yeah, exactly. And for us on the other side of it, it means instead of maybe three quarters of a house tonight, you're going to have a few more. A couple hundred more people are going to be there because they saw that go up on the board and they're going to grab it. That's right. Exactly. And that audience, that audience is the most receptive and available and working with you. And that's the energy in the theater that's so, ah, oh, you just can't, you can't miss. You just can't. Well, it's, oh, it's, that, it's that thing called theater goers. Because that's what their poison is. You know, if that's, if you, and we're all bitten, most of us have been bitten that way. You yeah. Know, if if that's if you've been there, done it, felt it happen, nothing else gets you quite the bang for your buck. That's right. Yeah, it's, those special nights where you suddenly get stunned and surprised and taken by surprise, you know, whether you're crying or laughing until you practically pee or whatever. I agree. You really you're really getting this stuff out today, aren't you? A little bullshit, a little pee. This is this is this is wonderfully, okay. wonderfully my... candid, oh. wonderfully candid work. <laughs> no, but it's true. You know, there's something sort of sacred about the fact, and we don't acknowledge it. I'm sitting in a room, facing the end of the room, and there are people of my generation, living uh, their lives, who've come onto the stage, basically to do this in front of me for me. Um, I think it's why the power and the awe of knowing it's actually happening in the space in front of you, unprotected. Yeah. And there's, that's like bullfighting or something, yeah. you yeah. know, really yeah. scary. Yeah. And so, yeah. and there are, there are yeah. extraordinary things like um, uh, who was it that was playing Hamlet in London, having gone through the death of his father? Oh, there will be blood. What's his, that wonderful act? That wonderful act, married to Rebecca Miller. A Daniel Day Lewis walked off stage. Yeah, in the middle of performance of Hamlet at the National Theater, it was so searing that he walked off stage, walked out of the theater, went to Florence and learned how to make shoes. Right. And didn't return. I don't know that he's ever been back on stage. I think he said he retired after that last movie. Well, that's moved from films. Yeah. But he hasn't been, he hasn't stepped foot on a live stage in all that time. Yeah, right. I'm about to fall out of this chair. I just tell you. a moment. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, look, I'm just slipping away here. This is, <laughs> oh my God. Oh my Are you God. okay? Oh, yes, no. it was terrifying for a moment. <laughs> the chair ate me. <laughs> well, it's a new chair. It hasn't uh, gotten. It's a new chair. <laughs> and I, I'm like a seven year old. I get it in and my little feet hang down. So it's not, it's probably not a good idea. It's live theater. 
I'm risking my life just to have this conversation. With you. Um, I was uh, just going to say something. Wait a minute. Here we go. Okay. Over the years, yes. have you worked on any projects that fell apart that you still think about? Oh, that's an interesting question. Oh, wow. I hadn't thought about that one. Um, that I fell did. apart. Have you, do you have one? Well, I'll dig in. I'm thinking about failure a bit. I'm thinking about the shows that I wanted to have to have them, them to be wonderful, and they weren't. And I don't know why. I gave my all. Everybody gave their all. We had a wonderful time doing it. Um, forgive me, but Impressionism was one of them. I know, yeah. I mean, when everybody read that script, they all wanted to do it. It's true. And we had a fabulous time rehearsing it. Yeah. I made a fatal mistake thinking I should do it in two acts. It wasn't written in two acts. Mm -hmm. That confused the audience. We, we, saw, we saved that. We fixed it in an afternoon. But the critics were pushed off for 10 days. And in that 10 days, it was the perception that it was a disaster. Yeah. And because we were, quote, in trouble which we weren't. We made a big mistake, but not a mistake of quality or value. Right, 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 right. And there right. was Joni Allen and there was, you know, yeah. Jeremy and there was you and and and, uh, and, and Andre, Andre De Shields, yeah. yeah, who killed the audience every time he opened his mouth. That's right. And Bob James did this beautiful score. Yeah. Scotty, Scotty Pass did a gorgeous set. I mean, yep. it was stunning. Yeah. It was. So I think of it with great fondness and, and, and a sense of, wow, you don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So there's, there's that. I'm sorry I'm wiggling around here. There's, but, you know, what can I do? Uh, there's, there's that aspect of it's out of your control. In that way, I've often said the play has its own soul. The play wants to be heard for the way it is. And after you're solving the problems and sorting through the truth and trying to get everybody to do the right thing, you have to wait for the play to prove like bread and then become what it wants. Because mm -hmm. they, for me, the single most important thing is the writer. Yeah. The imagination of the writer who willed that down on paper. Yeah. And so then you think of something like Shakespeare, where you think a bunch of his jokes are fi almost 500 years old and they're still funny. Yeah. 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 Now that's good writing. Yeah. Sell when you can. You're not for all markets. You know, you can say that. You can say that. In, you know, Home Depot when people fall off. And they, they don't say it at Home Depot. <laughs> no, I've never heard I got the idea. anyone but... at Home Depot quote Shakespeare. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Anyway, yeah. it's uh, I have fondness for, like scars, I have fondness for them. Yeah. I earned them. And I was responsible, and I'm sorry. But no one starts out to do bad work. And it's a mystery to us in an odd way, why some of them work and some of them don't. Yeah. Tumbling. Don't you think? Yeah. Yep. So, I only but, had one experience where I failed um, miserably, uh, but it was, you know, it's, it's fascinating um, as an actor um, because I was going to do Happy Days uh, for a theater in in Berkeley uh, in uh, San Francisco. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, and I wound up um, having to pull out, and it part of it was that I, I couldn't quite understand what the director wanted, and but I think the reason for that is is because I was not in an emotional place to be able to do the show. And part of that is because like you said, it's the, it, it just has to do with the way I work and what matters. Do you know what I mean? In terms of reality and everything. Um, 
Yeah, Be I'm, I'm going to jump off here because Happy Days is basically a monologue. And when you say the director, you didn't understand what he wanted. My, my hairs go up, what I feel that I have. Because that's when a director gets in trouble. Mm. If you have Samuel Beckett and Marsha Mason, shut up. Mm. And if you can't find it in Beckett, then, then you step in and say, maybe you try this. But to be in a room with you doing that of Sam Beckett, I don't think I would have much to say. And one shouldn't. Now, if it's an ensemble piece or a musical, mm. it needs a lot of carefully constructed work, then maybe so. But I don't think a director has any right saying to an actress in a single play, monologue, basically, mm. this is what I think it's about and what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. Your answer then is, well, put on the dress and you do it. <laughs> yeah, that's possibly true, too. Um, but the other thing I was thinking about also is the difference, for example, one of the other things that I, I learned so beautifully from you was, uh, in All My Sons, was how you, when you choose the people that you like to work with, your set designer, Doug Schmidt, and your lighting person, Natasha, and everything, you let them do their work. You know what I mean? It's, you don't have this, um, I mean, obviously you have a concept, right, in your head because you've chosen them, but then you let them do their work. Well, that's the point. I mean, if you're lucky enough to be working on this level, you know, you're fortunate enough to have professional people that are going to work with you, you need to find out why, where their enthusiasm lies. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you think, okay, I wish it were a little bluer than that. That's a little more green than I thought. And they can think, oh, that's okay. Or they say, ah, but if we do this, and you're off and running with something completely neither of you saw. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it's interesting you mentioned the word concept. I don't know that I can ever think of I'm not one of those directors who conceptualizes. Mm -hmm. I try to find the truth inside the text. And that guides me. And then the actors will tell me if it's true or not. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's great. That's beautiful. I'm putting a frame around that stuff. I'm not on stage. Yeah. I'm the audience. I'm the, I'm the actors and the playwrights' first audience. And I try to think about that responsibility. I think it's true. Yeah. So you've got, you've got, you've got a future now, don't you? Because you've got, a, you've got some irons in the fire, don't you, honey? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Can we talk, can you talk about any of them? Um, well, I do have one project called Swimming Upstream where yes, I, wanted, I want you to talk about that. Oh, okay. Well, um, uh, I'm going to be talking to a particular regional theater that's interested in uh, helping develop out the material with a, a series of acrobats with a group of acrobats, um, uh, because, um, it, it is not talk about concept, but, um, it was a movie, obviously. Um, well, I shouldn't say obviously. It was a movie. But um, the playwright, um, screenwriter, uh, decided he wanted to try to do it as a play. And it involves swimming. And um, I, I am trying to create swimming without water. <laughs> Sensational. <laughs> so I, it, it, it just thrills me, you know, because it's like you get to dream and see if it can come true. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see what happens, but. But this is the difference. This is the wonderful difference about you because you throw, you were talking about swimming. You tend to throw yourself into the deep end. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you really do. And yeah. I mean, most people, most people starting their, 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 directing careers would say, could we have a nice kitchen sink? 
Is that you or me? No, it's me. me. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I have moved this camera so many times. I can't imagine people aren't throwing up into wastebaskets. For <laughs> no, actually, it's been fine. And you look quite nice. I just want to say that I love talking to you. And I, I love listening to you. The, the great thing about friendship and a friendship like ours that crosses over between relationships and work is that you never run out of stuff to talk about. That's true. You know, how many times have we sat in front of each other with or without a cocktail and or a food or a script in front of us and carried on like this? Yeah, it's true. It's just so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's so boring for other people, but it's not for us. No, no, it isn't. <laughs> I love you. I love you too.